Good evening, everyone who are watching this live program from India, and good morning to those who are watching it from the United States. Welcome all of you to the live program number 157 at Orthopedic Principal. Today, our guest of honor is distinguished faculty, Professor Dean Vukic from the UT Southwestern, Texas. Prof. Vukic is the professor and chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at UT Southwestern, where he holds the Charles Gregory Distinguished Chair in Orthopedic Surgery. He's also the medical director of orthopedic surgery at UT Southwestern. Prof. Vukic spoke on ankle fractures and diabetics, calcaneal fractures, diabetic foot, and chaco foot, and also the surgical approach to hind foot arthropathy. And today, Prof. Vukic is going to enlighten us on midfoot charco neuroarthropathy and the surgical approach. So today, it's my great honor to bring back Professor Dane Yukis for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Professor. So this is the uh, third, the trilogy in my discussion of charco. We talked about the general overview and we talked about the ankle and hind foot. And today we're going to talk about the midfoot. And I truly appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, speak again. These are my disclosures. So I've shown this slide in the past, but it's, it's a little bit busy, but I want to highlight out that my approach to Charcot is that if there's no infection or foot ulcers and they have good bone quality, I prefer to use internal fixation. If there's compromised bone quality, as you can see on the right, sometimes I'll supplement that with external fixation. And if there's any sign of infection, I will use external fixation. But the bottom line is I think as a surgeon, you have to be flexible in treating these particular patients. The types of internal fixation available for the midfoot include plates, screws, K-wires, Steinman pins, or combination. But I think the key thing that you have to remember when you're doing a Charcot reconstruction that is you must do a realignment arthrodesis. You can't just fix this in situ and you can't just fire some wires across there like you might with another dislocation. You really have to have a good you know, arthrodesis to maintain your durability. Now, when you look at doing an arthrodesis in Charcot, it really is a problem with biology because we know that the synovial mesenchymal stem cells can differentiate into chondroblasts and make cartilage, osteoblasts and make bone, lipoblasts, which can make fat. So they're actually pluripotential. But these stem cells in patients with Charcot are not normal. There's a decreased number of colonies. There are decreased size in the colonies of stem cells. And gene expression is also decreased. So the bottom line is we're dealing with a problem with our biology at the beginning, regardless of what type of fixation we use. And also remember that a different cell line are osteoclasts, which come from the hemopoietic stem cell line, not from the mesenchymal. And we also know that Charcot, as we've talked before, is an inflammatory process, especially in the acute phase. We get some form of trauma. It releases and stimulates the formation of inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF-alpha or interleukins. And then they create this nuclear transcription factor, kappa-beta, and osteoclasts are made. And they tend to destroy the bone faster than the osteoblasts can repair the bone. And this is just an imbalance, as you can see, between bone uh, being made and bone being formed uh, by the osteoblast and be bone being uh, eaten up by the osteoclast. Now, when I look at midfoot Charcot, it's challenging. And I used to say that I would rather do 10 ankle Charcots than one midfoot because of the multiplanar nature of the foot. It's in the transverse plane, as you can see here. The foot's abducted or it could be adeducted. It can be in the sagittal plane, as you can see here, where the right heel is not even touching the ground. The patient's rock, rocking on a rocker bottom foot. Or in the frontal plane, it can be rotated. And this is an extreme case where the foot's rotated almost 90 degrees to the floor. And you have to deal with all of these deformities when you're planning a reconstruction. And that's what makes it challenging. I've shown this slide before. Basically, the biomechanics of Charcot, we have to think about the arches. There are really three arches. There's a medial arch, a lateral arch, and then a transverse arch that we have to plan on reconstructing to get a durable result. The biomechanics of Charcot, as we talked about the longitudinal arch, 
Well, we know that on the dorsal side, you get compression largely from the bones. But on the plantar side, the tension side is created by all of these uh, complex ligaments and tendons, as you can see on the bottom of this foot. And that includes the plantar fascia, the plantar intrinsic muscles, as well as extrinsic muscles that insert in the foot. And these ligaments on the bottom side of the foot on the plantar surface are very, very strong, and they actually will contribute to the deformity unless we take advantage of them in our reconstruction. And if you look at a normal versus a, an abnormal foot, on your left is a normal foot, and you can see the weight-bearing axis. It's going to come down the tibia across the ankle joint through the lateral tailor process, and your ground reactive force is going to be distributed in your forefoot between your fifth metatarsal and your first metatarsal head, and then in your hind foot. But compare that to a Charcot that's got a cuboid that's collapsed, as you see here, and look how close that patient's weight-bearing force is to the uh, ground reactive force. And so it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult problem, and we have to recreate the normal anatomy. And so when you have something like this, those forces are just going to keep pounding the foot against the floor, and it's going to flatten out the medial and lateral longitudinal arches, and it's going to compress dorsally and make this on tension on the plantar. So when we look at internal fixation and fusion for uh, Charcot with screws, really they're a very small series. Uh, about 24 years ago, Dr. Hansen looked at 24 patients. Interesting, about half of them presented with ulcers but he had limb salvage rate of about 86%, pretty darn good 24 years ago. Mean time to union was about five months. And then at Ohio State, Dr. Simon looked at 14 patients that he operated in the acute phase in, in Eichenholt stage one. And what he found that he was able to get a solid fusion in all 14 patients, and he had a limb salvage rate of 100%. This was kind of a, against the traditional thinking at the time. People felt that you should not operate on these patients while they were acutely inflamed. So Dr. Simon's article uh, changed our way of thinking, even though it was a small series. In the meantime, then his series to unassisted weight bearing was about four months. Then Dr. Lou Schoen, who's really a great thinker, talked about plantar plating. And he found that biomechanically, it was a strong construct because when you would weight bear and you had a plantar plate, when it would be compressed, it would create those uh, compression forces into uh, tension and actually compress. And so it would deform those plates and ultimately compress the fusion if it was placed on the plantar aspect of the foot. So it was a very novel technique. Uh, it would become load sharing with weight bearing. And the advantage was that over extra medullary screws alone, it had significant biomechanical improvement. The disadvantage was that it required extensive stripping and a lot of dissection uh, to put that plantar plate. And as you can see in this example, it's hard to get that plantar plate under the head of the talus because you have the talus and uh, calcaneus articulating. But it was a really, it was a good step forward to recognize that the plantar aspect was really the tension side and stabilizing it there added biomechanical improvement. Intramedullary fixation, uh, we started to think about this much like we do with a tibial nail or a femoral nail or a humeral nail. And basically they're subjected to three point bending uh, using an axial beam or bolt. Simply we call it a beam if it's cannulated, it's a bolt if it's a solid screw. And this is an example of a patient where we did intramedullary beaming on and we used uh, these uh, you know, cannulated screws and we've got an excellent solid arthrodesis. And so it became you know, a really good technique because when you would do the intramedullary beaming, you were putting this on the dorsum of the foot, but closer to the plantar aspect, and in theory, hope neutralizing the, uh, the plantar uh, tension forces. And we look at beaming uh, for Charcot much like when you build a building and you're building concrete. You know, if you look at any building or even, even when they're building roads with concrete, they put rebar in there. And so beaming really acts like rebar in concrete. It reinforces this. So this stimulated me to look at a review of medial column, column beaming. It's accepted for publication, should be coming out very shortly. And we uh, did the typical uh, inclusion, but we ended up with 16 studies 
that utilized beetle column beaming. And what we found in this, we, we look at these 16 studies and we actually, there were two different types of implants. So, so those that were designed for Sharko specific indications. And then there are other cases that were non Sharko specific implants, like a large cannulated screw. So we ended up with uh, 16 patients, I mean, 16 studies. And the results in 278 patients when we did a meta-analysis technique is the mean age, as you might expect, was around 58, 59, about two thirds were males. And in this series, uh, five out of six patients had diabetes, one out of six had a non-diabetic form of Charcot. But we found that about one in four patients had a hardware complication, and it seemed to be that migration was more common than hardware breakage. The surgical site infection rate was about 14%, which is actually very similar to my own studies when we looked at just doing routine surgery in patients with diabetes and neuropathy. But the overall good thing in this series of 278 patients, the limb salvage rate was 92%, very high. But the complication rates included reoperation rates of 24%, non-unions rated graphically of 19%. Now a non-union in a Charcot is not necessarily a bad thing like in a patient without neuropathy, because if you have a stable deformity, uh, a, a non-union can actually be very uh, functional. The mortality was relatively low. A lot of people talk about Charcot patients have a higher risk of mortality. Why would we operate on them? But at a follow-up of about two years, only three out of 100 patients were, were dying. So this gives you a credence that these patients, uh, you shouldn't sit there and say, well, they're going to die. Why should I do something? And in this series, these weren't uh, patients that were uh, highly selected. About a third of them had a foot ulcer and about 7% had a wound healing problem. That's lower than I typically see, but this is a group of uh, 16 different studies. And when you looked at it a little closer, they supplemented the medial column fixation in 43% of the patients to include subtalar fixation in 33%, lateral column fixation in 84%. But the overall, when we looked at the quality of the studies using the Coleman methodology score, it was poor. So this is not high level evidence, but it is evidence of 278 patients. But they did have a follow-up of uh, 24 months on average. And so when I think of a arthrodesis in a patient with midfoot Charcot, I think of it as a race between a successful fusion and failure of the implants. Because if you don't get a solid fusion, you're going to see, like in my patient here, where the uh, the screw actually broke in a couple different locations. And the reason for this is patients will unknowingly stress the construct because they have neuropathy. Neuropathy also increases the risk of surgical site infections and the rate of non-union. I don't consider them bad patients because they walk on it. They have difficult problems with balance. They don't know what they're putting on it. So it's just something you have to expect, which means you have to make the, the construct robust. I think vitamin D deficiency is certainly common in the US. I don't know about the rest of the world, but it's something that we think about and we try and correct. And so these patients may have an underlying metabolic bone disease, especially if they have renal disease. And we always have to worry about glycemic control in these patients on a long-term basis and even perioperatively. And finally, nutrition. I think everybody should remember that being obese does not mean that you're well nourished. And as I've shown in previous uh, talks, once you get an ulcer, your amputation risk increased by a factor of 12 or 1100%. And so this just demonstrates that same slide again. So it makes sense to me that we want to intervene before these patients develop an ulcer. So what if we can prevent the ulcer by minimizing the deformity? Then we can prevent infection and we can prevent amputation. And that's my whole thought process to how I treat Charcot deformity. But how do we prevent the ulcer from occurring? Simply by preventing the deformity or correcting the deformity. And this is a study that we published in 2014 where we looked at about over a thousand radiographs and tried to come up with some predictions about what particular changes were associated with ulcers. And what we found was the lateral talo first metatarsal angle, as you can see, in a normal person on the top and a Charcot person on the, on the bottom. That if you looked at people who developed an ulcer, 
their mean angle was about 30, 30 degrees. Those without an ulcer were about 26, and you can see the control. All three of these were significantly different. And we found ulcers occurring even with an angle less than 11 degrees, well, around 11 degrees. So to me, when you start to see this lateral talofest metatarsal angle uh, drifting below 10, 12, 15, I think that that's one of the indications that you should be thinking about intervening surgically. And the other thing that was very important was this cuboid height. As you can see, normal on the top, abnormal on the bottom. Normal, your cuboid height should be positive from the weight bearing. On the bottom left, you can see that the cuboid is below the weight borne line. And this is reflected on the graph on the right. The orange is the cuboid height, and it was negative five in the patients that developed an ulcer. The patients who didn't develop an ulcer with Charcot, it was at zero or above that line. So once you see a cuboid height going below the weight bearing zone, you can predict that they're going to get a lateral column foot ulcer, and that's gonna be very difficult to treat. So significantly associated with ulcer, lateral talometatarsal angle that's greater than 11 degrees, as you can see here, or a cuboid height that is negative. So once I see this foot drifting, I'm going to probably intervene. And if you do serial radiographs and you see this thing slowly changing over months, you can predict that this is going to happen. Now, once you see the cuboid height dropping, like you see here, that foot's also supinated. Look at how high the first metatarsal is. And so this foot is not only a sagittal plane deformity, but a frontal plane deformity as well. So here's a good case illustration. Patient had a relatively minor fracture of the third metatarsal brace. She had type two diabetes and she had some aching and midfoot swelling after running. Her pulses were normal and she had peripheral neuropathy that was rather significant. She had been treated for optic neuritis with high dose steroids and that, that's how she got her, her uh, diabetes. And again, you can see the oblique fracture demonstrating what I think we would all agree is a relatively benign fracture. But if you look at the lateral x-ray, you can see that there's some subtle widening of the plantar aspect of the first tarsometatarsal joint. But the talo first metatarsal angle looks great and the cuboid height looks great in this case. This patient was treated by somebody very experienced in Charcot, was placed into a total contact cast for 12 months, or for 12 weeks. And after 12 weeks of total contact casting, despite being treated really, really in standard fashion, you can see that she progressed, so she now has a 32 degree abduction deformity. Her lateral x-ray actually still looked fairly acceptable at this point. No ulcerations. Seven months after the onset of symptoms, her AP alignment really didn't change much. But look at her lateral x-ray. She's now gone from having essentially normal talo first metatarsal angle to having an abnormal one of 28 degrees and look at her cuboid height. It's dropping below that weight bearing. So at this point in time, we felt that this demonstrated instability and we recommended surgery. And this was her preoperative lab. So you can see that her vitamin D was low, her nutrition was fine, her A1C was not great, but it was better than we'd hoped. Sometimes we like to be low, below 8%. But you can see after eight months, the, the, the appearance of her foot and she's a high risk patient because you can see on the right side, on the left side of the film, she's already had amputations there. She has a rocker bottom deformity. So we did a wedge osteotomy. We corrected the hind foot by doing the Achilles tendon lengthening and stabilized that provisionally. We reduced this. We did intramedullary beaming with large fully threaded cannulated screws. And we were very pleased with our reconstruction in this patient. This is preoperative and postoperative and preoperative and postoperative. Now I'm going to show you a person that I used external fixation. And you can see that this person on the right, on the left side of the film, but his right foot, pretty swollen. But look at his right heel on the film to the right. He's not even touching the ground. So this is a sagittal plane deformity. And as a result of that, because he's walking on that particular, he developed a full thickness ulcer here. And you can see it's not only a sagittal plane deformity, but it's also a frontal plane. That foot's supinated here as well. 
Now, the, the problem for me was this patient had had previous surgery. And so this was malaligned and it was not plantigrade. And this person, you can see that the calcaneal inclination angle is negative. The, uh, the first metatarsal is way up in the air, consistent with the supinated. The cuboid height is way below the weight bearing line. So this is a challenging, challenging reconstruction and it's associated with an open wound. So my surgical plan was to do a preliminary debridement of the ulcer and then reprep and redrape. I then planned on reconstructing the Charcot deformity using internal and external fixation based on what I found. And rather than lengthening the Achilles, I just completely cut it because I thought that that was something that needed to be done. And I removed the cuboid um, to get the, my reduction. And then I derotated the foot. And then my use of internal fixation would be based on what I found intraoperatively. And again, if there was no gross infection, I would probably use a frozen infection to a frozen section like you would do in a revision total hip or knee and then use internal fixation supplemented by external fixation. And so here's what it looks like after I did all that. You can see that I excised his wound and applied external fixation and it actually looked really, really good. And what I did is I did not put definitive internal fixation in, but I used temporary pins and it's not a great reduction, but the point is it was able to get the, the foot lined up so that the cuboid was not necessarily uh, protruding through the ground. And so if you look at, you know, at the time that I took the external fixation off, I add definitive internal fixation just percutaneously, and you can see the difference that we achieved. It's much improvement in sagittal and improvement in the uh, frontal plane, but not nearly as much as I would hope in a case that I was doing for the first time. But the bottom line, this is the ultimate test. You can see that his foot is now plantigrade and that most importantly, this healed so that his risk of amputation, in my opinion, has gone down substantially. And so I would say that midfoot Charcot surgery is very, very challenging because you must restore that triplane anatomy in the transverse, sagittal, coronal, frontal. And remember that supination and pronation really is difficult to, uh, to reconstruct. Complications are frequent hardware failures, non-union, and infection. We have to normalize the Taylor first metatarsal angle and restore the cuboid height. The real benefit to me about doing the radiographic study and identifying what radiographs predicted ulcer was that now when I do an operation, my goal is to normalize the Taylor first metatarsal angle and make sure that the cuboid height is positive. I also restore the Halo first metatarsal angle, not only on the sagittal, but also on the AP as well. The key summary points, high suspicion, early diagnosis, prevent the deformity, prevent ulcer and infection, and we will prevent amputation. Midfoot Charcot, I think intramedullary beaming, which is a cannulated technique is quite good. Intramedullary bolts, which is non-cannulated is also quite good. You can do this with a cannulated technique and insert a solid bolt uh, fairly easily. Use the arm largest implant that is practical. You don't want to blow out the cortex of the metatarsal, but clearly the biggest implant with the VEX fixation is the best. Remember that the failure rate is more likely by pullout rather than breakage. So really get good thread purchase. Most people would advocate including the lateral column and some would advocate including putting medial column plating. I think the one thing that we've learned in addition to putting a beam down the medial column is to use a supplemental derotation plate. These beams are really good in three-point bending, but they're not great in torsion. So by putting a medial column plate and eliminating the torsion really can help this. And there's debate over whether or not to include the subtalar joint. I personally do like to include the subtalar joint, but a fair number of outstanding surgeons do not do the subtalar joint as well. When you do this, you should anticipate limb salvage rates that are in excess of 90%. And as I've mentioned before, in Charcot, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. We're still taking those baby steps in Charcot, but like my granddaughter, who is uh, three months and playing a little golf and then now riding her horse, uh, hopefully we'll be strolling and cruising in the very near future.
And I thank you very much for allowing me to talk again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for yet another fantastic lecture from your side. Uh, great learning points. A few questions. Uh, Prof, uh, suppose we are able to detect a midfoot charcoal, like what you said, the example of the widening of the tarso metatarsal space, a positive, I mean, a cuboid that is just going to go down, or a slight variation in the lateral uh, tallow first metatarsal angle, and we try to do a fusion. I mean, we try to put a beaming screw. Now, how does beaming actually work? That's the whole concept. If you put a beaming screw, the articular cartilage was still intact, isn't it? So how does we how do we achieve fusion? So is there a risk for breakage of implant because fusion has actually not occurred and we have put a screw inside? Thank you. That's a great question. So as a reconstructive surgeon, I prepare the joints, and so um, in theory, you could say, "Hey, you've got this acute charcoal. If you can get an absolute reduction and you fire a beaming screw down there." you could potentially stabilize this without preparing the joints and it would heal and get stability. But I'm a big believer that when you do a fusion, whether it's in the lumbar spine or in the ankle, I think it's more preparation than it is what implant you use. So I would say that when I do a beaming screw, I prepare the joints and I, that's what I do. Now it doesn't take much to prepare the joints. You know, you can go in there, you can use a curette, small osteotome, and get rid of the articular cartilage. But I think you really have to prepare the joint as well. Does that answer your question? So uh, you cannot do it technically using a purely minimally invasive way, isn't it? Because I you suppose you could. I, you know, I've, I've thought about it. If I had an acute charcoal that was well aligned and just, you know, what, what would happen if you just fired some beams up there and kept it perfectly aligned? Because we know that these bones do heal. The joint, the charcoal heals and maybe just that stimulus of crossing the joint would allow it to heal. But I, I still think that in my situation, you don't need that big an incision really to, to remove the articular cartilage. And I think uh, you really wanna get a good, a good fusion. Um, and you know, some people actually have done an acute reduction and put on an external fixation without preparing the joints. Some people with tibial nail, retrograde ankle arthrodesis nails don't prepare the joints with acute fractures and they report good results. I haven't gotten to that point, but that's an interesting study. And it would be interesting if you actually got enough acute patients who were still inflamed and you did this percutaneous beaming, how would they end up? And that would be a really neat study to do. And how difficult is it to put a non-candidated screw? I mean, putting a candidated screw is, becomes easier. And if you have a non-candidated screw, that, that adds more to the rigidity, isn't it? So even if it doesn't unite, the chance of breakage is going to be a little bit less. Yeah, so that's a good question. All the, can, all the non-cannulated bolts that are put in, they use a cannulated technique first. So the first thing is you do put a guide wire and then you drill the appropriate side. And now you, now you put some, maybe put some additional K wires to maintain your alignment. And then once you've drilled, it's usually, easy, it's pretty easy to find the path uh, when you do it. Uh, it's not as difficult as you would think. We do fifth metatarsal fractures now, similar. We put in solid screws, but we do a cannulated technique. You're right that a, a, um, a solid screw or solid bolt is going to have better three-point bending strength or fatigue strength than a cannulated technique. That seems to get less the bigger the outer diameter. So the smaller the screw, the better a solid screw is. But when you get to a bigger screw, it becomes less of a problem. What I found really good in my, you know, they're much more expensive to use the, uh, the specific implants for Charco. And I've had good success with large cannulated screws that are fully threaded. And they get a lot of good purchase along the whole length of the, uh, of the screw. So that's a good alternative too. It's less expensive, they're cannulated. And I like if I can put in an 8.0 screw for the first, for the lesser metatarsals, it's hard to get something that big and you can use different things. But you're right, mechanically, a solid bolt is going to be better than a, uh, than a cannulated one, but it probably, that, that difference goes away the larger the outer diameter becomes. Also, Prof, a related question is, when you're planning to prepare the joints, like as you said, the new articular cartilage, which are the joints are you looking at and where do you place the incisions for that? So, Good question. Some authors believe that if you had a Lisfranc Charcot, that they would 
do the torsal metatarsal and the navicular cuneiform. They would not cross the talonavicular joint. I've had experience now where I've done that. And then a year later, the, because the fusion is distal to the TN joint, the TN joint subluxes and ends up with a problem. So when somebody has a midfoot Charcot, I'm going to beam from the first metatarsal into the talus. Then laterally, the way I beam laterally is I actually do, I don't go intramedullary, but I'll insert my beam between the third and fourth base of the metatarsal or the fourth and fifth and beam it into the cuboid. And when I put a headed screw there, that gets caught between the base of the metatarsal and works well. When I beam the second metatarsal, I go intramedullary. So I, I actually, when I beam, I like to go from the forefoot to the hind foot and stabilize the, the talus and the calcaneus. Thank you for that, Prof. Uh, Senthil is also online. Uh, Senthil, Senthil is a staff orthopedic surgeon based in Texas. Senthil, your questions to Prof. Rukic. Prof. Rukic, uh, nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, when you put this uh, medial screw, uh, do you go from the plantar aspect of the forefoot or the uh, dorsal aspect? Good question. You can do either. You can do, a lot of these patients have stiff toes. And so if you try and do it from the plantar to get enough dorsiflexion to enter the metatarsal head can be difficult. And actually when you're teaching, sometimes that can be a little tricky. What I've actually started doing is making a small dorsal incision over the MTP joint of the first of the metatarsal, plantar flexing it and putting my guide wire in uh, under direct visualization. If you're, if you're very facile with this technique, you can do it uh, percutaneously through the plantar if you can get enough dorsiflexion. The other thing that I've learned is the way I do it is I, I get x-rays on both the AP and lateral plane, and then I will actually mallet the guide wire in because I can control with my hand the direction I want that to go. And I'm looking at x-ray because you want that to be center center, just like you're putting in you know, any other type of device. But uh, you can go dorsal or plantar, Sometimes in the teaching session, I'll, I'll just go dorsal because it's easier. And when you try to put the screws, do you try to achieve compression or is they are just like there uh, as a so supporting screw and how do you do it? That's another great question. The, the Charco specific implants were designed that you could get some compression. And one of my colleagues, you know, Dr. George Tai Lu, you know, when I first got here, he put in a lot of fully threaded I can't sell a screws for fusions. And I was actually critical of him. I would say, you're not getting any compression. He said, it doesn't matter. And you know, it's interesting that I've watched. And so I've, I've actually done that a lot now. So when I do uh, my medial column with a fully threaded can't sell a screw, uh, number one is I put the guide wire in and I drill appropriately, it's smaller. And the one thing I don't do is tap because once you tap with a can't sell a screw, you lose the purchase. And then what we do is we just gently put the screw in and we come back a little bit, put it in. And we don't try and get compression, but what, what I find is you actually do get good apposition of the bones. And we've had very, very good results without putting a compression. I will tell you my failures have occurred when I've used partially threaded cancella screws to get compression. And that's when I did it. I did that before I really uh, believed what Dr. Lou was telling me. And those seem to always fail right at the junction of the thread and the shaft. And I have not seen the failures in those cases uh, since I've been on the larger one like this. So I don't think compression is as is, is important as we've been taught, but that's just my opinion. And and for the subtalar arthrodesis, when you come uh, do it uh, with the beaming, do you open the subtalar joint uh, from a lateral incision, prepare it, or you just percutaneously do it? I think, you know, that's another good point. Once you stabilize the talonavicular joint, virtually no motion occurs at the subtalar joint. I think you could very comfortably do it percutaneously. Um, you know, sometimes my exposure medially is such that I can do the subtalar joint through the medial incision. You know, you go right underneath the posterior tibial tendon and you can, you can do it there. That way you don't have to have a lateral incision. If I have somebody with a valgus deformity, I don't like to make lateral incisions. If I have somebody, you know, just that's way, but so I think, I think it's dealer's choice there. I don't think you necessarily have to prepare the subtalar joint because there's gonna be such little motion across there once you get the, uh, the uh, talonavicular fused as well as the calcaneal cuboid complex. There just won't be much motion back there. But basically by, by doing a medial column, a lateral column and a subtalar, you're creating a bridge from medial to lateral, you're joining these. So I actually think that it's important to do that. But again, others 
uh, disagree with me, and uh, they're very fine surgeons as well. And uh, I think uh, I read a paper about uh, from you about the cost effectiveness of early surgical reconstruction of uh, charcoal uh, midfoot surgeries compared to bracing, lifelong bracing, uh, depending on the stage. Uh, can you just uh, tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. I, you know, again, it's like uh, if you think about lifelong bracing in somebody with Charcot, uh, they're going to require invariably special shoes, braces that have to be changed. And that risk for ulceration never goes away. You know, once they have a deformity, um, it doesn't take much to start that ulceration. So I think early surgical intervention, and I admit in my own experience and everybody else's, there's a high complication rate with surgery, but that complication rate rarely impacts the final result. For instance, I will tell you that in my own series of several hundred now, I can recall one patient that had a midfoot Charcot reconstruction with, who didn't have an ulcer before surgery that I went early that ended up with an amputation. So in my own series, my limb salvage rate is greater than 99%. Now, once they get an amputation, big, big change. I mean, once they get an ulcer, it's a big change. So I believe that despite a high complication rate of surgical site infections, hardware failures, et cetera, ultimately it doesn't impact the final result of limb salvage. And I think if you can give them stability, uh, then I think it's really very cost effective. It, it, to me, it's, I, I think of the analogy very similar to ankle fractures and diabetes. You know, we know that treating an ankle fracture that's unstable in a patient with diabetes is gonna end up with a bad result. I believe the same thing is true here. And largely, I think that the reason we have not been more aggressive surgically is number one, people were afraid to operate because of the complication rate. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that the limb salvage rates are high. Number two, they, we didn't have great fixation like we did now. And number three, around the world, a lot of these patients are not treated by orthopedic surgeons who are experienced in these techniques or podiatrists who are experienced. You know, in, in parts of the world, they're treated by internists like endocrinologists or maybe a vascular surgeon. And they're great at restoring supplies, but they don't have the same skills with reconstructing the bone that we do. So I think a paradigm shift is necessary. And like I said, I, I wanted, I hope that my career ends with the ability to change the thought process on this and say, listen, we need to treat these much like we would a fractured dislocation elsewhere in the body. That's great. And uh, one last question. So if a young orthopedic surgeon is trying to get into the field of charcoal neuroarthropathy surgical management, and he's trying to build a team, what do you think he should have as uh, resources and core members? I think first of all, you, you need several different things. I think number one, you need a great nurse uh, who can help you with the patients. I think it's good to have vascular surgery around. Vascular, uh, critical limb ischemia in charcoal is not common, like a diabetic foot ulcer, but once in a while, you're going to need a vascular surgeon in some patients. So you need a vascular surgeon. I think having a, a, a surgeon such as a plastic surgeon that can help you with flaps or wound problems that inevitably will uh, be involved. I think an infectious disease person, I think an, uh, an internist or a primary care person who is really interested in a diabetic foot. Uh, and then I really think the other thing is somebody that's, whether, you know, if you're in a place that has an orthotist or somebody that can make good shoe wear and braces. It's really a true, it's a train, uh, true team, multidisciplinary approach to it. Um, and I don't think you never have too many uh, members of the team. You know, I think as an orthopedic surgeon, it would be great for you to lead that team because, you know, you need, you know, endocrinologists help, you know, vascular surgeons help, but you can all pull it together. I think the way, the way that I look at myself is I almost considered myself a surgical diabetologist. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a really good talk and a lot of uh, good points. Thank you. I don't have any more questions today, if you can take over. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. I think that we don't have any more questions. Thank you for joining in, Prof. It is really nice to listen to you always. I mean, there's been so many lectures. There's been such an enlightening moment for all of us. I mean, thousands of people all over the world are going to benefit from your lectures. And not only uh, orthopedic surgeons, it's also going to benefit patients as well because so much of knowledge is being uh, shown on the, uh, I mean, it's totally free all over the world. Thank you very much, Prof. Well, I think if we can educate our patients about the early recognition, then we've done it's ourselves so a service. We've done everybody a service. To me, you know, I would say to you as a surgeon, the best operation I do is the one that I never have to do. <laughs>
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.